to start, members, just remind the electronic devices should be switched off, excluding the tablet devices which you <coughs> be used to view your devices. Brief overview of today's business, briefing from SWC and Libraries NI, departmental briefing on the European Social Fund, departmental briefing on the summary of response on the consultation of development and modern efficient and effective employment tribunals, and our committee inquiry into post special educational need provision and education, employment and training for those with learning disabilities. And that will be the consideration of the draft report. Members, apologies. of apologies from Anna Lowe. Is there any other apologies? Sydney's can be late. Yeah. be late. Members, chairpersons, business, there's none. Draft minutes. The draft minutes of our meeting on the 10th of February is on page 6 of your pack. Members, I just ask you to agree those to be a correct record of that meeting. I think so the sign has been accurate. Members, matters arising are on page 13. Um, the agreed action points are listed there. Are members content with those? Yes, sir. Mr. Reyes, content. Members, correspondence then is at page 17 and also tabled. Members, at page 34 is correspondence from Nicva regarding the Secretary to, to, as the Secretary for the Development and Community Sector Departmental Monitoring Groups. Members, they want to meet with the clerk and myself to discuss our, our legacy report. Which we haven't agreed yet. So, members, any comments or? I don't think there'll be any issue. Uh -huh. <laughs> See what they think. You go ahead and meet them. Content, mm -hmm. I can, I'm content to meet. I would. I'm content to meet the members, but there would be. I suppose keen to stress that it's the committee's legacy and it's yeah. what we decide as, yeah. as our direction yes. and what we put into it. So. Just to make that clear, but yeah. Yeah. intend to meet them and feedback yeah. then yep. if there's anything. <coughs> Members, table to page two is a letter, a letter from CBI and reducing gender pay gap reporting in Northern Ireland. Members, just for consideration ahead of the further consideration stage of the employment bill. Just to you know to think CBI haven't been making contact with with all parties. So, okay, members, in regards to correspondence, sections agreed uh, are suggested as agreed in this indication. Mm -hmm. Members, content. Yep. Members, page 56, there are three invitations listed. If members wish to attend any of the events, can you let the committee staff know and they'll make the appropriate arrangements. Members, forward work programme is at page 40. And you'll see the forward work programme there for our, <coughs> our next four meetings up until the, the 16th of March. Other meetings may be scheduled as they arise. Members, just want our inquiry report date in the chambers due to take place on the 1st of March. So it's tabled at 6 o'clock on the 1st of March. So 7, 7 o'clock. So just to be aware of that as well. Okay, members are first out. On the, on the debate, I had previously proposed that we get a sign language interpreter there, but I presume that's not going to make sense at 7 o'clock at night. No. I don't think so. The thing about it, fellas, we... It's seven o'clock at night and the, the order paper split yeah. so it could go into Wednesday. Oh no, exactly. exactly. You know, it's, so. not, it's not going to make sense there. But so if, it's going to be, if Monday drags on, Tuesday drags on, we could have to be on our, yeah. on our own on Wednesday morning. Can I, can I flag it up to you that um, I intend to propose that at our end of session report that one of the legacy, legacy issues we leave is the need for um, this place to hold a, a debate with the sign language interpreter in the next Monday? Mm -hmm. I think I'll start for right. yeah, no problem. So you can remind me when we're doing the report because I'll probably forget. But you guys can remind you if I was here. Right. Okay, members of agenda item seven is a briefing from SWC and Libraries NI. Could I just welcome Mrs. Joanne Lucas, Cookstown Campus Manager, South West College, and Miss Muriel Todd, Assistant Director of Libraries NI. We just thought it'd be kind of special thing to get a, a briefing from yourselves with the interaction between the two. So, mm -hmm. ladies, over to you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. 
Um, if I'm Joanne Lucas and I'm going to start off, I'm just going to set the background of the, uh, of the development in Cookstown, outline the uh, nature of our provision and give you some of the advantages and a few of the disadvantages that we experience as being part of the uh, joint library facility. Okay, so the shared Southwest College and public library facility at the Burn Road, Cookstown was completed in 2006 and officially opened in November 2007. The single shared building replaced an outdated and disused school and a small public library which occupied the town centre site, owned jointly by the former East Tyrone College, which is now Southwest College, and the former SELB Library Service, now, now Libraries NI. The project costs £2.4 million and is part of the Department of Employment Learning's commitment to providing first-class facilities to students. The concept for the development of the campus was to provide a community facility offering part-time, evening and non-vocational courses. The link with the library, as well as being opportune because of the shared site, was seen as a way of promoting this vision. The, um, the tech, as it was known, had offered in the past courses such as hairdressing and joinery at the Cookstown site, um, but provision for skills development in these and other vocational areas was made at the Maind and Gannon campus, which also had a major refurbishment. The decision was not to duplicate this provision in Cookstown. The Cookstown campus, although small, has six modern classrooms with state-of-the-art teaching facilities and three computer suites. So the type of courses that Cookstown offers are classroom-based courses or IT-related courses. So, for example, our current provision for this academic year would include um, full-time extended diploma in performing arts, OCR entry-level certificate in life and living skills and Princess Trust team programme. We offer also a, a wide variety of FE part-time, both day and evening, including essential skills, literacy, numeracy and ICT, book, bookkeeping, part-time special educational needs provision, ESOL and a range of health and safety courses which um, uh, relate to business provision. In terms of training, we have the SUS Plus programme, which is t targeted towards the unemployed, the youth programme. Currently, we have a panel building academy and we offer CAD SolidWorks. The Cookstown campus is also the management and administrative base for the outreach programme to centres for adults with special educational needs across the entire South West College region. And it is home to the Inner Tech Centre, which is the college's knowledge transfer, research development and commercialisation department. In terms of the shared arrangements, we share the same entrance with the library. The library occupies the majority of the ground floor and the college occupies the top two floors. We do have the college reception and caretaking office on the ground floor. The additional shared space includes the student social area which is used by library members who can access the vending machines provided by the college, male, female and accessible toilets and also a staff room. The floor space allocation between the two organisations is approximately um, for the college 936 square metres, the library 550 square metres and a shared space of 546 square metres. Southwest College is responsible for arranging maintenance and general management of the building, such as intruder and fire alarm, pest control, legionella, and the cost of these shared spaces and services is apportioned on a 6337 basis. With reference to the library structure itself, Libraries NI are responsible for the interior of the area they occupy. Now, there have been a number of advantages to the college of um, the co-location. Um, and the, the main advantages are the college has increased visibility and accessibility to the general public. The college campus is not seen to be an intimidating building, but is part of the community. And there is a visible link between informal and formal learning. 
a second advantage due to the increased football, footfall through the building. Um, we have been allowed to market and promote our courses locally and also then through partnership working to target market some of its provision. So for example, from time to time the library offers short courses in IT and the college has been able to promote its essential skills IT as the next step, again linking informal to formal learning. Unlike the other campuses of South West College, uh, Cookstown doesn't have um, its own learning resource facility and the campus has therefore benefited from having access to the library resources in terms of books, computers and study space. <sighs> the library also manages a small collection of books uh, relevant to our courses on behalf of the college. Cookstown campus has always provided courses for students with special educational needs and these students are encouraged to use the library facilities during their college day. This enriches their experience of the college and helps to integrate them into the community and this is something that will stay with them after they leave the college. The college has also been able to collaborate with the library on events such as Community Relations Week. Um, the main areas of concern for a shared location um, the main area really surrounds um, child protection and vulnerable adult protection. Um, the public library offers free access to its facilities to everyone uh, and does not vet any of its users. Um, and this could be uh, potential risks to a student population made up of children and vulnerable adults. And the second area of concern is around sort of noise disturbance and inappropriate behaviour from children and teenagers who sometimes view the library as a place to hang about in. Um, but notwithstanding these areas of concern which require management, um, the relationship with the library has been a positive experience for the college. It works well in the Cookstown situation because we are a small campus and we have a town centre um, location. Um, and that's, that's the end of what I would like to say. Thank you. Okay. Um, good, good morning, everyone. Um, just to follow on from um, all the background that Joanne has given, um, from a library's NI perspective, location is key for libraries. Um, people come to libraries voluntarily. They, they choose to come to a library not because they have to. Um, so we always look for locations um, that need to be accessible, visible to the public, uh, perceived to be a neutral venue, um, that they front onto a main thoroughfare in an area with high footfall and passing traffic. And certainly in, in Cookstown, um, there was no change for the library users as it was built on the original site. People park there, go into the library, use the college, and then uh, shop in the, in the town. And Literally, from a, the difference that a location to a library uh, can make. Um, last year in Lisnaski, um, we built a brand new library on the main street. Originally, it had been co located with the health centre. Um, it was a fairly busy library at the time, but since moving to the new site on the main street, our membership has increased by 119% and our visitor numbers have increased by 137%. So, uh, you, you know, which equates to over 10,000 additional people. Um, the customer base, certainly from Libraries NI, is slightly different to the, the college. Um, the majority of our customer base is made up of young children and the over 60s. Um, our young children, the, the 0 to 11s, uh, equate for 47% of our membership and the over 60s for 40%. So libraries need to be easily accessible to those particular groups. Um, we do have a slightly lower teenage membership because um, sometimes libraries aren't deemed to be cool for them <laughs> to, to hang out in. Um, Libraries don't normally provide textbooks, um, as we usually see that the, the educational establishments will tend to provide those. But in, in the um, situation of Kirkstown, we, we do uh, hold a number of the, the textbooks, as there is no library facility there. Um, we also work well with the South West College in 
OMA Library, um, even though the college isn't actually co-located with the library. Um, but doesn't mean to say that we can't still work in, in parallel with the college. And I suppose it, it um, backs up what Libraries NI has really been doing over the past number of years, um, that we have worked <coughs> in partnership with a number of organisations um, and government departments to achieve benefits for both parties. Um, we currently work with Dial, with DE, with DARD, DFP and people like Invest NI, just as a, a few examples. Um, libraries NI uh, encourages people of all ages and sections of the community into libraries um, and Joanne uh, related that college staff are probably less comfortable with our more informal approach but Libraries NI does have safeguarding policies, you know, even though, as Joanne said, we do not vet people as they come through the door. Um, and even though libraries do provide very short IT courses, um, it's usually only for a couple of hours, and it is at the very basic level, so we don't feel certainly that we're in competition with, with the college. Um, that, that, I suppose, just uh, is another few bits of information. Thank you. Phil? Thanks, Robin, and thanks for the presentation. Uh, my interest lies in this and the, in the potential redevelopment and relocation of the, the library and the scale. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there are very obvious synergies there in terms of potential for relocating it on the same site as the redevelopment of the South West College campus and the Old Earn Hospital site. Um, and there's currently a business case that's being finalised to look at the, um, the future redevelopment of the library, which is proposed anyway. Um, as part of that business case, has anybody been in touch with either yourselves in Libraries NI in Cookstown or with the South West College in Cookstown to see the, the benefits that could be offered by having a co-located site in Inniskill? Um, well, we, uh, Libraries NI has a service level agreement with the Education Authority. They are the ones who provide our specialist knowledge and um, completing any um, economic appraisal. Um, and certainly at the minute, uh, the Education Authority is costing seven options um, for that outline business case. Um, we, Libraries and I, hope to complete uh, and submit that business case to, to DECAL uh, once it's been approved by the Libraries and I board, hopefully ar around the end of March. Um, that then goes forward to the economists in, in DECAL and once obviously they're um, satisfied with it, they pass that on to the Minister who will then take the decision. Okay. Okay. In terms of the actual running of the facility itself, um, libraries and I obviously own most of the books, uh, but the South West College have some textbooks as well and other sort of academic material that wouldn't be in other libraries. Um, yeah, the library has um, w will issue and you know keep track of a small number of books that we have um, that relate to our courses, um, but that that's the limit of the number of books that they have. Uh, at one stage, we did offer a foundation degree in performing arts, yeah. and part of our service agreement with the University of Ulster was we had to have a library facility. And not having one on site, we had made this arrangement with the library, yeah. um, and they were doing that on our behalf. But uh, what I'm trying to say, there isn't a separate library card for college students. It's a, it's a library's NI membership scheme that gets you access to all of the books. Oh. Yes, but I think their cards are marked, um, right. you know, so that they can confirm that they are a college student, so they can take out a college book, whereas a member of the public couldn't take out a college book. Okay. Um, is that the case? Uh, that's uh, it, it, that, sorry, that, that's yeah. maybe not the case. I mean, we we are a public library service, so we wouldn't uh, we we wouldn't not allow a, a right. member of the public to borrow a book that we. Very rare to be interested yeah. in it, just. <laughs> These are books that have been purchased by the college, you know, and owned yeah. by the college. So. Okay. Um, in terms of the, the opening hours, um, many libraries have faced pressure to reduce opening hours or um, been told that they haven't reduced opening hours. How has working with the <coughs> college in Cookstown allowed um, your library to um, sustain opening hours? Um, does, it, does, does such a partnership allow for more um, evenings and weekends and things like that? Well, from, from the Libraries NI point of view, certainly, we are open one night a week. The, the college doesn't yeah. tend to stay open. We're open um, three nights, three yeah. nights a week. Yeah. 
at the, at the minute Monday to Wednesday, yeah. but it doesn't. There's no conflict with yeah. having different opening hours. It yeah. works, you know. But the, but the opening hours aren't harmonised. The library's not open when the college is necessarily open. It, it hasn't been possible. Uh, okay. Simply, we have had reductions to our budget, uh -huh. like, uh, like many other departments, and we've had to change the opening hours in Cookstown, as in many other locations. Okay. And what are the financial savings that have been presented by having the two uh, facilities in the one place? I uh, I don't have yeah. that information. Uh, unfortunately, but that, not, you don't need to provide new numbers. But can you give me some obvious examples of where savings have been made through? Um, there's, there's not the same need to, to duplicate, serv duplicate services? Um, well, the, the, the maintenance of the building is split 60-37%. Um, six, uh, um, you, you know, so we, we pay for the, the area of space that we actually use, so th there's no real savings in, in, in that. Okay. okay. Um, and the, the final question I have is, you, you flagged up the issue of child protection and vulnerable adult protection in the, in the college, um, but is it not the case that any member of the public can go and access um, the catering facilities or the restaurants and on the other campus of the South West College as well, so that issue is flagged up by the fact that you have a publicly open and accessed restaurant as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, we, do, we, we would have that issue. Uh -huh. So it, it, it isn't uh, strictly limited to Cookstown. Um, it's maybe more heightened in that mm -hmm. people are coming in, they are going into, let say, Dungan and campus, they're going in for a reason. Um, where people come into the library, they could spend the whole day in the library. They could be sitting amongst our students when they're taking their tea breaks, their lunch breaks. Uh, so it is maybe a, a greater issue for us okay. in Cookstown. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Phil Bromo. Thank you, Chairman. Phil has covered some of what I was going to ask, but I just want to commend you on your presentation and for the excellent work that you're doing in Cookstown, Lisnesky, and also Dungannon Library. Uh, could I just ask, how do you feel that you could uh, enhance the facility that you currently have, you know, within the Cookstown area, the shared facility? How how could that be enhanced to even increase, for example, you know, having more service users coming into the Cookstown area? Because I am conscious it is a very rural area, and uh, you know, I know in my constituency of Dungan, we are always in competition with Cookstown. As well, it's, it's 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 an issue. But how can how can you enhance that shared facility in Cookstown? What type of feedback do you receive from the public, and what can you can do? I know people still talk about the times when there was hairdress and then there was joinery, and mm. they would like mm. those things probably uh, in Cookstown as well. But you know, because Dungannon offer them, and there probably isn't a sufficient population to offer it in two places. <coughs> Um, it's maybe difficult from that point of view to, um, you know, to offer those kind of courses. Um, we are currently looking at trying to increase the number of health and safety courses that we offer and trying to appeal that to, to local businesses um, and trying to uh, increase that provision. I think certainly from Libraries and I, um, over the past couple of years, mm -hmm. we've worked much more closely with Joanne and, and her staff to promote everything that the college is doing and vice versa then the, the college has been very helpful in promoting any of the library and I activities and events you know happening in uh, there. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks Paul. Jared. <laughs> thanks very much. Um, thanks for your presentation. Obviously this is not my area in terms of consistency, but I do appreciate the issues that you're touching on that you're that you're dealing with and on the library stuff. In my constituency of Ford, we've had some challenges around library opening hours, particularly in the more rural areas, the outlying areas of the city <laughs> of Derry. But um, I just wonder generally um, as just what your view would be in terms of uh, obviously people have changed the way that they engage with literature now in the age of the advent of technology. A lot of people are reading stuff on ebooks and <laughs> Kindle and so forth. And uh, you know, obviously, I can appreciate fully in relation to the college the service that the library provides because it's not only access to textbooks and a wide range of other books, but also a space to do work in for academic work where students can go in untroubled and all distracted mm. and, and work on stuff, so I can see the value of that. But I just wondered how you think the impact of that technology and the way that people are accessing books mm. might have changed uh, the, the challenges and the things that you face as oh. a service, generally? Oh, I mean, certainly it has changed. and. Um, I alluded that, that Libraries NI provides um, some IT 
courses um, and these tend to be very short courses, maybe a couple of hours. And we use iPads to actually um, show people how to download their e-books and the, the free magazines that are available to, to Library NI membership. Um, so yes, we fully embrace um, all the, the new technologies. We have a lot of our resources that are online that people can access from home. Um, or via their, their tablets and, and Android um, devices. So we fully embrace that and we like <coughs> work and always promote the IT part um, of the, the e-resources, as we would tend to call them. And do you find that's having much impact just generally physical footfall-wise because people can access stuff remotely and maybe are, when they want a book now... The tendency is to maybe look for a free ebook at home or uh, get um, something on Amazon as opposed to maybe physically walking into a it, bookshop or a library? Or? It, it certainly does. I mean, uh, th th we have a, a huge membership who maybe just download our ebooks and our e magazines. Um, but that all comes as part of our statistics. Um, you know, it's not that we don't count them as, as our users or our membership, we absolutely do. Um, so whether they actually physically come through the door or whether they download and make use of our e-resources, they're still library members. And presumably in terms of the students, that also the access to services includes databases and research articles that they might use for stuff? Or Yes, uh -huh. they, yeah. I mean, they, we would encourage all our students then to sign up as members of the library so they have access to anything that the library has and they can access our own facilities as well remotely. Through the through the library computers, so they have our access to our resources online as well. Very good. The other thing, Chair, I just wanted to ask about is obviously in the past, libraries were a great starting point for people. People that maybe were interested in genealogy or mm -hmm. sort of what's called now, I suppose, ancestry tourism, where people are kind of looking at mm -hmm. you know these issues. And, and libraries would have always stocked huge volumes of old newspapers and that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. Is that something that's actively promoted by way of? Uh, getting increasing numbers of people to engage with the library service <coughs> not just about picking up an ordinary book but you could come in and access oh, a much wider range of things uh, absolutely um we have a, a huge heritage collections um throughout northern ireland at, at various locations and certainly um we, we do encourage we run a number of what we call ancestry classes where we try and encourage people and show people how to do their genealogy searches, how to you know develop their family trees, um, because libraries are still very much about um, supporting lifelong learning and supporting study and supporting research. Um, we tend to do it in a more informal basis as opposed to the more formal way that, that the college does it. And it's also used as maybe exhibition space? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, the whole cultural uh, you know, heritage you. as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Chair, it's a very good service. You were in Kells Library last Thursday yeah. doing the Family History Day, and people come in and go through prony records, ancestry, mm -hmm. and all the rest of it, supported by a library's NI officer, so it's, okay. it's worthwhile. Tom, there you go. Thank you, Chair. Again, thank you for your presentation and a welcome of work that's been done between the college and Ottawa and the library, although they're on two different sites. Mm -hmm. It shows what it actually can be done. But if we look then at the smaller uh, villages, if you like, or towns, uh, where there's been library services and there's been difficulties with them. For instance, we look at Fintna, I think, and Cyan Mills, and we've had over the last few years, we've had problems and difficulties where. Uh, there the, was the reduction, there was the um, threat of closure and all that type of thing. Is there any work between the colleges and those libraries in mo and out in the more rural areas that have been used by the people from a vast rural area who don't really travel to Oma, if, mm -hmm. uh, if you like? Is there any potential to do any work between the colleges and the libraries in those areas that would perhaps maybe help sustain the, the libraries in those areas and also provide um, uh, a further service within the library for uh, the people in the area? Mm -hmm. um, certainly in the likes of Fintana, um, we work with a, a number of organisations where uh, we ask them to come and deliver events and activities in Fintana Library. Um, recently, I think there's been a lot of what, what we term was the end of our Health and Mind project, which was about raising awareness of, of mental health issues within the community. And certainly what that pro project showed us was that we could... Pe people were much more encouraged to... Um, 
attend a, a mental health course if it was in their community, particularly in a library where there's no stigma attached about going into a library, um, as opposed to maybe going into an office of action mental health where people tend to know what you're going in there for. People walk into libraries every day um, and nobody knows why they're going in, whether it's to do the, the ancestry, um, you know, to look up their family tree, to do an iPad course, or in, indeed attend some of those mindfulness courses that we've been running in the likes of, of Fintana. So we, we certainly work with lots of other organisations to come in and deliver courses in the library. I mean, certainly that is key for Libraries NI to promote those services and to make use of the, the library buildings. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And, uh, sorry, Ms. part of your presentation. I had a, another meeting in the constituency. And uh, I, I've always been a big fan uh, of libraries and uh, the social impact that it has had on many communities. And when you look at, uh, certainly my own constituency, the likes of Falls Library, uh, that's antique but a lovable antique in, in many ways and i've just i've, I've seen over the years the, the the changes that there's been and now what what there is to offer and i think uh the, the they're classic examples of uh, moving on with times and uh drawing in from a very young to the very old so i think uh the the they're, they're excellent excellent places of learning and uh, uh for for people but i can understand where fellas come from because a number of years ago when i was in a belfast city council uh, we had uh, with uh, done a, a number of trips, uh, mostly on the round leisure hubs and things like that. And the, the big thing uh, at, 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 in England, and I think you, you see it in some places in Belfast also, and that is creating that uh, physical uh, learning uh, and leisure hubs that has libraries, has leisure centres, has uh, health centres together, and all three, where people, uh, young people come out of school uh, they, they can go in and swim, but when they come go out, they can go over and do their homework in libraries. So I think the, the point that, uh, that, that, that Phil is uh, uh, making is crucial, because I think at a stand age, you can't afford to remain isolated away from what could be the, 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 the main audience that you're trying, trying to attract. So I think that uh, in, in future, when the people are looking at things, they, they need a, I think, uh, I think in the Grove and, and <laughs> Belfast is, is, is one of the hubs. And maybe in the Shankill, there's the, the, the health centre, along with a library attached to it. Uh, uh, uh. So I think there, there are a number of Shannon examples of how you can actually mix uh, keeping people fit, learning them to read, and, uh, and other aspects of life. Um. Certainly, um, yes, I was very much involved in, in the whole Grove Wellbeing Development yep. in Belfast. And in recent years, we were asked by uh, Banbridge Council to look at a, a similar, smaller facility in Rathfra Island. Um, unfortunately, that sort of didn't come to any fruition. But Libraries and I are always very keen to, to look at options and, and work with other partners. Thank you. Okay, folks, thank you very much, and thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. members moving on agenda item 8, then, the departmental briefing on to the European Social Fund. Members' papers are tabled on page 6. I would like to just welcome Mr Colin Jack, Director of Strategy, European Employment Relations Division, Mr Conor Brady, Head of the European Union, and Ms Fiona White. Social delivery branch, so she's a user very welcome. Good morning, uh, Chairman. Um, Sorry. We try and get the briefing document that they. That was emailed last week. Was it? Through now? No, for the library. Oh, for the library. Okay, sorry, Colin. Sorry. Um, just. Um, Connor has been with uh, with me at the committee before uh, on these issues. Fiona White is the new uh, accountant who has joined the ESF team, uh, and uh, this is her first time at the, the committee today. So uh, we, we have sort of ongoing uh, developments in the, the in staffing of the, the team. So uh, just always keen to introduce new faces to the to the committee. Um, we last briefed the committee. Uh, on the 23rd of September on progress with the ESF programmes 
uh, and there's been significant progress since then with both the outgoing uh, 07 to 13 uh, and the new uh, 2014 to 20 programmes. Uh, I suppose the first thing to say is that in terms of the government programmes, uh, training for success and programme led apprenticeships, uh, as well as uh, apprenticeships NI, uh, some of which we, we brought into the uh, old programme. Uh, during the course of last year. Uh, we made all the payments in respect of those programmes uh, by the uh, deadline, which was the end of December. <coughs> so that means that we should have uh, sufficient eligible expenditure to claim from the Commission uh, to make sure that we draw down in full the allocation uh, for Northern Ireland under the 07 to 13 programme, uh, which was 190 million euros. Uh, and I mean, it's important just to record that because uh, we had the issues with the, uh, the, the voluntary and community expenditure, which meant we couldn't claim those uh, from the Commission, uh, but we've been paying those projects out of departmental funds. Uh, and again, since September, we've made uh, significant progress with those payments. Uh, we now have 83 uh, of the 95 projects, so that's just under 90% of the projects uh, fully paid up. Um, there's uh, potentially up to £3 million left to pay. Um, that's about 1% of the overall payments from the department under the old programme, and actually about £2 million of that is, is, is in relation to one specific project. Um, so, uh, in terms of the new programme, all 67 projects have been up and running now for several months. Uh, we had a visit from the Deputy Director General of DG Employment in the European Commission uh, in November, uh, Mr Zoltan Kazatse. Uh, he came and launched the project directory, uh, which uh, is available on, on the department's website, and if we haven't already uh, given the committee copies of that directory, which gives details of all the projects and, and uh, their target groups and so on, uh, we can make those available. Um, the total value of the projects in year one uh, of the new programme is £33 million, and £21 million of that is the uh, ESF and Dell contributions uh, that are paid out by the ESF Managing Authority, uh, and almost £10 million of that uh, first year's funding has been paid out to date. Um, as well as the funding from the ESF Managing Authority, uh, the department provided match funding for 27 projects, that's the 35% share of the funding, um, and that totaled £2.8 million in the current financial year 2015-16. Those were primarily the disability and uh, projects and the ones targeting uh, young people not in education, employment and training, uh, as well as the projects which followed on from the former Lemus programme. Um, so all the projects should now be seeking to finalise their match funding for 2016-17, the new financial year beginning on the 1st of April. Um, we haven't made an announcement yet about uh, those projects where the department is a, is a match funder, but we would hope to be able to make an announcement on that reasonably shortly. We're just hearing from uh, a few of the organisations which need to confirm how much they require from the department before we can make that announcement. Um, we've established an, an ESF forum with the projects, which has met so far twice, and it will meet again on the, the 15th of March. Um, the forum and its subgroups have so far concentrated on the issues that are set out in the paper that we've uh, given the committee. Uh, so the, the ES1 form, which is to be completed for participants, uh, and we've uh, reached a, a way forward on that and uh, informed the, uh, we've worked with the projects and, and informed them all of the outcome there. Um, the other issues that we've been discussing with the forum have included the teaching uh, qualification requirements for tutors uh, and then progression for participants beyond level one uh, qualifications, which is, is the limit for uh, the projects other than the disability projects, uh, and work's ongoing to resolve those other issues, uh, including at the next forum meeting, but we have subgroups uh, that are meeting in the meantime. We've also put in, in train a process uh, of engagement between the FE colleges and the uh, projects to facilitate progression of participants from uh, the ESF projects on to qualifications at level one and above uh, in the colleges.
So that, that's really all I have to say by way of introduction, and we're happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks, Colin. Fiona, you're very welcome. Thank you. It hasn't been an easy subject, I think, either from the department or the, or from a committee point of view. And I think every time you've, you, ESF has appeared in front of us recently, we've had a new, new member of staff to, to argue. We had Sheila with John Noble, and I don't know where they are now within the, the managing authority. Well, Sheila, Sheila's on holiday at the moment, actually, right. or she would have been here today. But uh, John, she, she is, and John, John has moved to another post within the department okay. uh, dealing with European policy. Huh. Colin, just taking back to you, and maybe work from the, the briefing paper that was supplied, supplied to the committee. Um, I will, I, I hope you don't mind, but I'll take exception to what you said earlier on about the reason money the ESF funding programmes were transferred to apprenticeships was because of problems with the, the vulnerable community sector. It was, was problems with our ability to claim that money. Yeah. I didn't say it was problems well, that, on the part of the project. As, as we're clear in that, so that's. I think as a, as a starting point. In regards to the monies, then, you're talking there, when we finish off the 0713 programme, that not all the monies will be claimed due to drawbacks or due to reduced expenditures. Because that's departmental money, what happens to that underspend? Well, there, there isn't an, an underspend. Uh, Sorry, the unspent monies, then, because surely it's all allocated to this minute and ring fenced. Should all those programmes claim <coughs> their full entitlement? Well, we, we have uh, catered for the uh, payments to the projects in terms of uh, accruals of budgets from previous years uh, at the end of the year. Uh, we, we always make assumptions about the likely level of underspend in advance. Uh, and uh, so uh, in terms of setting uh, the, uh, the accrual amount at the end of the year, we, we make the, our best your, prediction. Your briefing paper, in summary, there remains payments with a maximum value of 3.41 still to be made to 13 remaining organisations. Yeah. If, if you've made accruals and assumptions, what's the real value the department's thinking of for that? Well, I mean, we, we need to see what is the result of the vouching process of all the, the, the money. Uh, if, if any of the uh, expenditure is ineligible, then we're not able to pay it. But if it is all el eligible, then we can pay it. But Sorry, Colin, you, you told me the department had made assumptions there would be underspends. Yes. We're factoring that in. But at the end of the day... If so, sorry, was... your maximum value here is 3.41. Assuming those underspends, what is that real figure? Have you already calculated or allowing for an underspend? Where would that look? Well, we don't know yet because we've still got a few of the, the, the projects to complete vouching. But if we you know, had an underspend, it's really an issue for a previous year's budget. Uh, and so, I mean, it factors into the uh, end of year accounts and so on. But uh, you know, th th it, it's just money that, that is not uh, paid out at the end of the day if it was ineligible. <coughs> yeah. So where does that go? Well, that's my question. Where does it does it go back to the centre? Does it remain within the ESF managing authority? Um, well, if it's on a previous year, it just uh, you know it's in the past, and and you know that the books for that year are, are closed. So I mean, it goes back to the centre. I mean, Fiona, you're. you're <laughs> I'm not familiar with, with the actual detail of the right. figures for, for this project, but um, yes, it, it would go back to, to the centre. Go back to the centre. Yeah. If it can't be reallocated within Dale. Right. Okay. But it would be money from previous year's yeah. budgets, probably largely uh, for <coughs> 2015. Yeah. Okay. Um, just going on then to the, the 14, uh, four, 14 20, 20 programme, and I know there's still still some concerns right there. That's my thing. 67. Organisations successful? 67 projects. Projects. So there are a small number of organisations who run multiple projects. So I think we have 50, from the top of my head, 55 individual organisations running 67 individual projects. Right. So of those 55, then year one, based on the original letters of offer, 37.49 million? Um, well, that's yes, that may well that's what you have in front of you, then that's what the figure figure is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because there was some renegotiation with the projects in terms of right. uh, their ability to secure match funding. There was a slight shortfall in the match funding they could okay. secure, so the amount that, uh, they, uh, that was offered at the end of the day after the renegotiated letters of offer was around 33 million. Yeah, 33.2. Yeah. yeah. So 
So you have a drop there of 4.29 million in yes. year one. Yeah. So we were we were overcommitted by quite a significant margin at the outset, yeah. uh, and so we're still slightly overcommitted at this point. Right. So I think I think the figures are you're overcommitted on the Dale. Yes. Part, which is a 25 percent by 0.5 million. That's right. Yeah. Which <laughs> you I think are claiming will be brought back in house by year one, and your budget will be balanced at the end of year one. Uh, again, at this at this stage, it's difficult to say because we vouch the claims retroactively. We can't say until the end of the financial year until every claim which has been submitted to the yeah. department has been has so, been fully vouched. Conor, it's difficult to say why do I have a departmental briefing paper here that says it is anticipated that this overcommitment will be managed through potential underspends in Because that's been historically the case with the ESF programme, that every year there has been an underspend. What I'm saying is we can't speak to the specifics of how much that underspend will be until the end of this financial year. But every year, historically, projects have underspent. So we're using that assumption to overcommit the budget for year one. And, and that's the difference. I take your point there, and, there, and that has been the difference between the 37 and the 33. It's, we're down. I, I was taking your briefing paper as presented to us as, I suppose, I suppose as being factual, but if you're saying now this is hopefully in it, a potential estimate, is that what you're saying? You might not have the, one, the 0 0.5 million claim back in year one. No, the, 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 one, the 0.5 million is um, an overcommitment on the basis of all projects spending 100% yeah. of what they've stated they will claim. Right. Not every project will claim 100% okay. of what they said they'll claim historically. That has always been the case for a variety of reasons, whether they haven't got the right number of participants in, they haven't uh, spent the right capital amount, whatever it happens to be. So we're able to overcommit mm -hmm. by, half a, by half a million, or it happens that we have overcommitted. Um, now, bear in mind from previous briefing papers, and I think we mentioned in this one, our initial overcommitment was significantly <coughs> more than that. Yeah to allow for that um, effectively reduction across all 67 projects, bearing in mind what they would be, uh, the, the, some of the difficulties which historically, and it's demonstrated again this year, which they've had in finding match funding. That has an impact, obviously, on the, over, on the, the, the overall headcount figure. So the point five is, well, hopefully you'll be there by year one. Yes. Yeah. Oh, year two, year three, what are you estimating then? Well, we've a new budget for the 1617 uh, financial year. Uh, again, we have an overcommitment uh, in the region of uh, 6% across the programme. Uh, but we're because we're going into year two of the pro of the programme, uh, we would anticipate a lower percentage over commitment in year two than we would have done in year one. So we were around ten percent, or indeed initially we were more than ten percent over committed in year one. Uh, at this stage, we're around six percent over committed for year two. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, w w we've actually got a bit more in our budget for the 25% share, the, deep, the Dell share, in year two than we had in year one. Uh, so that reduces the, the level of overcommitment in year two to compared to what it was. The overcommitment you're talking about there, that 6% overcommitment is in the Dell share? That's across all the strands of, of the, uh, the funding for year two now. Uh, in, in, when we very first allocated the money uh, for the 2014 to 20 programme, uh, we were significantly overcommitted on the Dell share, the 25% contribution, uh, more so than on any of the other strands. Um, we uh, have got additional money in our baseline for 16-17, so that we have a lower overcommitment on that share. How much more money are you going to call on your baseline? Um, it's. Uh, I think it's one and a half million extra. I think the baseline is, is 7.8 million for that share in 16-17, where it was 6.3 million previously. Okay. <laughs> Indeed, uh, sorry, it's a million more than that. It, historically, that budget had been 6.3. Last year, it's 7.3. Next year, it's 8.7. Okay. Um, this is the. I suppose the, the three-year part of this. 1420 yeah. project we're talking about. Yeah. When do you expect, and I'm watching your briefing paper as well, you're talking about maybe changes in regards to level two, qualifications potentially changing in the next round of this programme. 
When do you expect to set the budgets for the next round? Or have you already those set? Well, we already know how much ESF money uh, we have for the second uh, half of the programme because the allocation is for seven years. We've got two and a half million euros. Uh, at this point, we only know uh, the departmental budget for 16 17 because there's a one year budget. Uh, but uh, we would anticipate having uh, money. Uh, in the baseline uh, that would allow us to continue into to year three. In terms of the second half of the programme, which will run from April 18, uh, we would uh, expect to run a call uh, for uh, that period uh, during the course of 2017, uh, and uh, any changes will need to be made in advance of that. Uh, and we would expect to have some engagement and consultation on, on that. Right. And I suppose one of the things we got from the last programme was always about lessons learned. Yeah. Uh, well, have you learned and uh, learned from the lessons as to and to this fourteen twenty programme? Well, we have we have learned lessons. We've certainly learned lessons on issues like vouching, like resourcing the the team to to carry that out. Um, we, in terms of the the policy issues and the way those are working, I think we we have the ESF forum in place, and we have uh, much more systematic engagement with the projects than we had in the past. Uh, so we're getting feedback on an ongoing basis on the issues, uh, and in terms of actually monitoring the performance of the organisations under the new programme, uh, we we will have a, a computer system that is uh, uh, DFP. Uh, is the lead contractor on. Uh, there's been a, a delay with getting that into place. That will be in, in, in place uh, in May, we anticipate at this stage, um, and that will allow us to collate all the information about how the different projects are performing against their targets. Uh, so we will have some information on that by the time we need to make any uh, revisions to the new programme. I, I think the key lesson learnt, and it's, it's been a hard lesson for us and for the deliverers of the project, is not for us to underestimate the amount of work it takes running two programmes simultaneously. Um, that's had an impact on the department, but more importantly, it's had an impact on the project's ability to deliver under ESF. Going forward for the remainder, once we, once we get the 2007-13 programme completely closed, which, which will be another year's work, um, there's a huge amount goes on in the background in terms of meeting commission and audit requirements. So we have small resource team set up to address that. I think we shouldn't underestimate the amount of work that it will properly take <coughs> to run a new call from, we'll launch the call in 17, the programme will run from 18 onwards. That involves a huge amount of work, particularly in terms of policy development. And I think, I mean, you specifically asked what lessons were learned. I don't think we were, we recognised the impact uh, in terms of departmental resources to get the work done and get it done properly. Proper policy development, in addition to the huge amount of work with regard to auditing and vouching claims, is another separate body of work altogether. We've recognised that. I think we're, we're making slow steps, but we're making progress in bottoming out those policy issues with the providers themselves. And there has to be a recognition on the part of the department that we need to listen to the ESF providers themselves if we're going to bottom out the policy properly. And that needs to be done well in advance of the call itself. So I think those are the key lessons that have been learned, that there's a need to resource the branch and there needs to be a recognition of anticipating exactly the demands that running a competition, running a new call will have both on ourselves as well as the providers and it needs to be a two-way communication to develop an effective approach to that call. In regards to vouching there, Colin, you said the importance of vouching and <coughs> being properly resourced. Are you probably resourced at this moment in time, or why is there still the delay or the 30% prepayments? Well, we're much better resourced than we were. Um, there, in run up to Christmas uh, and the end of December deadline for making the payments in respect <coughs> of the old programme, those all had to be on the system by the 31st of December in order to make sure they were eligible for claiming from the Commission from the 7 to 13 programme. Um, we brought in additional resources from 
uh, employment agencies and we borrowed uh, people from elsewhere in the department to make sure that we got that work completed on time. Um, it did have a, a slight impact on the level of resources we were able to dedicate to the, uh, the new programme uh, and we have shifted some of those extra people onto the new programme uh, really as soon as we had those payments made at the end of December. So uh, we needed to make the, the upfront payments uh, to make sure the organisations were not uh, unduly out of pocket uh, over the period. But we're now uh, catching up with the vouching that, that has to be done for the, the, the early part of the programme. In regards, I suppose, to the three the three main concerns that were raised in the current programme, the ES1s, uh, general qualifications on level ones, and but you touched briefly on that. In the paper we have, ES one form has now been revised to take account of the following, and there's a number of issues there. Has that been issued to providers? It, it has been. Providers? I mean, this is, in resolving the S1 issue, it's been a collaborative approach, uh, specifically set up a working group comprising myself and members of ESF providers themselves to try and find uh, an approach to this which was acceptable to the department in terms of the audit requirements that the ES1 provided and the, because let's just go back to the nub of it. The ES1 form provides basically the foundation stone of the entire program and I think that was lost by a lot of individuals, or maybe ourselves included, because it demonstrates the eligibility of participants to take part in the ESF programme. Without that demonstration of eligibility, all of your other funding is effectively immaterial. So if you don't have that foundation stone, then potentially any other claiming, any other claims which an organisation makes with regard to that participant could be deemed ineligible. So it has to be right from an audit point of view because everything else follows from it. But the issue which was fed back to us, particularly from those ESF providers who were operating in the disability strand, was that it was providing a number of psychological, practical and physical barriers to participants actually coming onto the programme. That was very clear and it needed to be addressed. So what we did, again collaboratively in the working group, was create what effectively is a proxy provision um, for those participants who are deemed, who, who potentially could make use of this proxy provision. So rather than that individual going to the Jobs and Benefits Office uh, or the Job Centre themselves, the ESF provider can do it on their behalf. So we've introduced the administrative background needed to do that, uh, such as, you know, it's an additional form which allows the project to act on their behalf. And it's the, 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 it, it, I don't like the phrase a no-brainer, but this was a no-brainer. And, and that was very clear from the working group. Um, it was generally very much welcomed at the last quarterly forum. Uh, and I think it's a demonstration to the department of the simple solutions to a complex problem that can be created if you work in a collaborative sense. So that's the type of basis that we want to approach the next stages of the policy issues. But yes, all, all of that information has gone out to all of the, the, the providers, along with full memo, guidance, revised form, the rest of it. Has that been sent to JBOs and job centres as well? This was one of the key issues which was identified from the outset, was that the JBOs and the job centres were not acting with one voice, with one thought. So part of the background work that I was undertaking was engaging very specifically with that network, <laughs> identifying individuals within each individual job and benefit office and job centre, making them the single point of contact for all ESF projects, sending their contact details to the projects um, so that whenever they approached a job and benefit office, they had that point of contact who was effectively their ESF nominee so that they were acting in exactly the same way across the entire network. <laughs> okay. um, in regards then just to, I suppose, job centres and JBOs being able to work with a volume of applications coming in, as a ESF, you know, an ESF project that says maybe there's 50, 60 applicants going down in, are the JBOs and job centres adequately resourced or being able, if, if you're saying it's one point of contact, I'm just thinking, you know, same as, you know, Sheila's on holidays. If an organisation lands down in with 50 applicants or application forms, can you process them so we can start a course next month? Short answer is yes. Yes. I mean, what's actually happening, I mean, in, in some respects, it's actually more beneficial 
to take this approach because the 50 applications, I mean, it probably won't be 50 applications arriving in at one time. You may be talking 20 or 30, but they can be all processed in one go rather than being drip fed in over the course of three or four weeks. So there could actually be a concentrated effort in ensuring that all of the forms are processed, all of the participants are given approval at exactly the same time. So it actually, in some respects, streamlines the process. Teacher qualifications has always been, I suppose, it's been a, a sticking point due to, for, for many organisations who already had tutors in place delivering courses in the past. And there's now a requirement for them to attend UU. Um, I note there's a reflection from the Managing Authority in another working group. When will there be finalisation to that issue? I'm hoping to bring uh, a new proposal to the, um, to the next quarterly forum, which is taking place in mid-March. And again, th this is work which is underway at the moment. I've already received, prior to Christmas, we asked a number of ESF providers to give us submissions to undertake a degree of scoping work to identify those qualifications, those courses which were being delivered under the programme for which they thought the tutor didn't need to hold a CIT or an equivalent teacher training programme. I'm currently going through all of those submissions at the moment. In due course, I'll be working with other experts in the department who have greater expertise on qualifications than I do to see, can we come up with a robust rationale that can underpin all of these qualifications and is there an argument for certain exemptions. My initial thoughts are there are, but I need to bottom out that policy paper, then take that to another working group, because again, it's going back to this idea that this approach has to be collaborative. So I've received the initial submissions, but I need to take my initial policy thoughts or the department's initial policy thoughts to the working group and get their thoughts on it. But I would like to be in a position to present something to the quarterly forum in mid-March. Whose requirement was the qualification? That was the department's. The department's. Yep. So when you have to go back and argue to get that changed, it's going to be the department arguing with the department. Well, the, the requirement is... No, no, in all honesty, I know it may sound, but it is one policy unit arguing against another policy unit as to whether, it's, whether that requirement can be reduced to a level you're talking about, Colin. Well, ye yes and no, because we have to bear in mind, let's not forget the reason why this qualification was introduced, and it's for the participants, because they're the only people who matter. The whole point is to build capacity within the sector to ensure that the level of training and tutoring which is being provided to the participants is the best that we can possibly offer. Yeah, and it was introduced it, under training for success. So we decided to take on board the same policy to ensure that there was consistency across the board. However, there has to be a recognition on the part of the department that assuming a one-size-fits-all matter with regard to policy isn't necessarily the best way forward. I think we're recognising that now, and we're looking at those elements under the ESF programme where we don't have to, to take that one-size-fits-all project. And I think recognising where you've possibly gone wrong has to be the first step in, in remedying it, and that's what we're doing. Okay. Because you're, you're talking about the level of, the levels of qualification. I'm sorry, you know, the CSR, the first day in St John. These are exactly, those are the type exactly the type of thing we're looking at. It's never been in something that this committee raised a number, number of months ago, if not years ago. A number of year, a year ago, I know, that wasn't necessary. And I'm glad maybe the department has eventually listened, whether it's the stakeholder forum or the committee, but they are going to take steps to address that. Yes, absolutely. I mean, as I, as I say, the, the process is already in, in motion. Is, is end up so much frustration out there with, with other organisations. In regards to the, the level one qualifications, and I do note from, from the paper that you have presented, um, the department does not have any immediate plans to amend, the this is to deliver up to level one or above. And the, the comment that I note is, at least for the first call of the 1420 ESF programme, so is there a train of thought starting to develop within the department that possibly you should be delivering, delivering level two qualifications and above? We need to keep that under review. I mean, we've put in place uh, a process to make sure that there's better progression for individuals from the ESF projects to other provision like the FE colleges. Um, we uh, need to recognise, and, and we, we do have to keep coming back to the fact that um, Qualifications are not uh, everything that these projects are about. A lot of what these projects are doing is giving individuals additional support that they haven't had previously. I mean, for example, um, you know, if you look at 
um, you know, people, a lot of the people coming to these projects already perhaps have their GCSEs, but they have fallen out of provision for some reason or other. There, there have been uh, difficulties in their lives that have made it difficult for them to get uh, into the workplace. So there's a lot of support with employability skills, interview skills, uh, with mentoring, with helping people resolve other issues in, in their lives. You know, there are A lot of these projects are dealing with young people not in education, employment or training. So um, to understand this as a programme that is primarily about qualifications is, is to misunderstand it. Uh, but what we need to look at is whether there are unintended consequences of the, the limitation there is. Uh, it is a limitation that doesn't apply to all the projects because the disability projects uh, can offer qualifications uh, at whatever level is appropriate for the participants because there are barriers for those individuals uh, going to other providers. Um, but we are, we are discussing again uh, collaboratively with the groups what the issues are. We're trying to make it easier for people uh, to, to pursue qualifications through others and that could still allow them to remain on the project with the group that's providing them uh, with, with the additional support but to do the, the say a level two qualification somewhere else. Um, so we're, we're, we're trying to work around the, uh, the practicalities of that. Um, and uh, you know we will. We're, we're certainly reviewing it, and we will make changes if we need, if we, if we need to. I mean, the, the long and short of it is, it's policy development 101. <laughs> you don't put in a policy and then not review it. So every th every policy which we have under the ESF program is being reviewed. You know, we're 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 not going to say that every policy we've got we've put in place is right, because no policy developer could or should be saying something like that. And where the issues have been identified, it's entirely incumbent upon the department to, to carry out a review to see how or where those can be remedied. Now, you, your, your question, Chair, was in relation to looking at it potentially for the second call. The reason why we can't look at it under the first call is that it was a very clear criterion under the uh, competitive tendering process and the applications that were submitted under that process that qualifications would only be de delivered at level one. If we were to change that horse midstream, that would entirely undermine the competitive tendering process, um, which was launched for the first call. So there, there's, there's a very straightforward audit argument for not looking at it under the first call. But as Colin said, we are looking for carrying. We're, we're looking at carrying out a full policy review of it in an, in advance of any second call that comes out. Uh, in regard to that point, Connor, the disability sector. Was yes, it was very. Yeah, but the, the, the disability strand very clearly said from the outset before the competitive tendering process was run that you could deliver up to level two. Chair, thanks. Three. Just just a comment to, to Colin regarding qualifications. Mm -hmm. Colin, I know that there's community and voluntary sectors out there that, that have had to turn down people, for example, coming from you know, the food industry who are requiring a level two qualification in, in food hygiene because they've said level one is no good. So in some cases, you know, qualifications do matter, uh, especially at that level two. <coughs> you know, so I, I, I've had complaints. Yeah. Um, you know, people have complained to me regarding, you know, the fact that they can't deliver level two, for example, food hygiene certificates, and that is something that is required by food outlets. You know, right across the country, and they can't deliver that. So qualifications do matter. The, I did, didn't say they, they don't. I mean, those qualifications will be available from other providers. Um, and I mean, it, it, it's important to remember this program is for people who are furthest from the labour market. Um, it, it's filling a gap that isn't filled elsewhere. It's giving people that additional support that uh, the, the the providers. And I mean, it's a mixture of mostly voluntary and community organisations. There are some projects with colleges and others uh, in the programme as well. Um, but it's it's really uh, helping prepare people for more advanced um, qualifications and, and training. Um, and uh, we want to make sure that it helps people get on the skills ladder. And so, you know, there's a specific niche and a specific budget for this purpose. There are other programmes that can support people get the qualifications that they need once the barriers to 
any engagement in the workplace have been engaged. And I mean, we want to make sure through this process we put in train with the FE colleges, and, and we can do with others like the Training for Success programme as well. Um, we want to make sure that we don't unduly delay people being able to do that so that they can actually take some of these higher level qualifications while they're still getting the support on the ESF projects as well. Jared. Thanks, Chair, and thanks for the update, um, which I appreciate very much. Um, I'm relatively new to this committee, but I, uh, I am familiar with ESF, given my uh, community voluntary sector background, so I know that um, the programme over the years hasn't been without difficulties and challenges. Um, and I think that's the nature of a lot of European programmes. They just are fraught with bureaucracy and uh, they're a bit of a minefield. But we, I think it is important, Chair, that the lessons are learned um, in terms of going forward about how the programme is delivered uh, more effectively and you learn from the policy stuff that you're that, that you what works what doesn't work um, I think particularly of the providers and the groups because for some of these this can be the difference between being able to survive for the next few months or going out of business if they don't if they're not able to get their money and their claims <coughs> processed in a timely fashion and have stuff vouched appropriately um, so I think it is important to do that I am relieved to hear some of the stuff that Colin's saying around, I, I have a bit of a hobby horse about it, and I'm taken on board with Bronwyn has said about specific qualifications, but there is a sort of fixation or a fascination with accreditation uh, and, and qualification. When I'm not trying to denigrate any individual qualification because they're all required in their own place, when we look at the issues around employability specifically, and the multiple barriers that people face to employment, we have people walking around this country with bits of paper poking out of their pockets. That are unemployable. You know that's the, that's the reality of the situation, and they tend to do a circular journey around various organisations, groups, providers acquiring these qualifications. And whilst that's great, because you've got a record of achievement and all that sort of stuff, I am concerned and anxious about how that translates into actual employment outcomes at the other end of that. I think there's sometimes more effective ways of doing that. That's not to say that qualifications aren't important, because they are, obviously. But I, I'm glad to hear that the, there is a recognition of that. <coughs> the, the broader soft skill employability agenda, I think, is so important. It has to be worked on to get over those multiple barriers that people are facing to employment. The, the query, Chair, that I have, if I can beg your indulgence, is a very specific one. And, and I take it that you may not have the answer to this, but I would ask if you could provide it to me, if it would be possible. And it relates to a written question that was um, given to the Minister by uh, Mr Agnew um, a few weeks ago uh, as it relates to the engagement with the women's sector organisations um, on community education provision specifically, and that's on the, the 1420 bit of ESF, I suppose. Um, the Minister had said in the response to the question about the, the engagement with this sector that there was ongoing correspondence and regular meetings with officials, with various people in the, uh, from women's groups. Would it be possible to find out what the extent of that engagement was and who it involved? It was a very broad answer. And, and also, the Minister had actually made reference to five dedicated women's projects that were currently being funded out of the 67. Um, would it be possible to find out who those are and what the, the kind of spread of that, or is that information available? Just to get a sense of, you know, the, the, for, in my view, the answer was very general. And I would just like to kind of see, dig down, drill down into the specifics of I that. Mean, we're, we're happy to provide information on that insofar as it relates to the ESF programme. Yes. I'm happy to give you details of those women specific organisations which are being funded in the nature of the programme. The, the wider issue of your question goes far beyond the ESF programme itself, uh, and it relates to the need or potential need for women-specific training generally. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to bear in mind that, that that's beyond the scope of the ESF programme, so I'm, I'm loath to speak too much about it, mm -hmm. because the ESF programme is very specific in terms of what it does. There are European priorities and departmental priorities, and this is a competitive tendering pro program mm -hmm. for which people lodge their applications, and if they're deemed to be successful, they receive funding. Whether there needs to be, and I think this is what you're potentially alluding to, a specific strand or specific funding within that program for women's training mm -hmm. on its own mm -hmm. 
is a discussion, I think, for beyond just the, the European Social Fund Managing Authority. Mm -hmm. So I can't speak much further than that today. But it's it's, it's a wider point. issue. I take that point, Chair, but as it relates specifically to ESF, can, can I have Absolutely. the details of, of that? Course. I mean, I, I the correspondence has been with yeah. who the groups are that have been regularly engaged with, and that's referred to in the Minister's answer, and the five women's projects that are that are listed among the 67. I, mean, I could give you the names of the five now, if that would be helpful. There, there's the Women's Centre in, in Derry, Shankel Women's Centre, First Steps Women's uh, Centre, and Women's Tech and Women in Business. So there are five uh, female-specific uh, groups that we're funding under the, the current programme, but I mean we've had wider engagement with those and other uh, projects working with with women only. Um, I mean, just in respect of your so comments, those five women only. Those five are the women. Yes, the women only organisations. Yep. Although I mean, there are occasionally male participants in some of the uh, organisations that are are ostensibly women only. I mean, when we look at the, the figures for numbers of participants, you do sometimes find there are a few men who take part in some of the projects that they run, but I mean, they're, they're primarily women's organisations. Um, uh, but in terms of your other comments at the start about uh, the European funding programmes generally, it is a challenging business to, to manage and plan. Uh, although the planning starts a very long time in advance, uh, there do seem to be funding gaps that sometimes arise between one programme and the next, and that was something we were extremely keen to avoid with the ESF programme. Uh, and we had funding flowing from the 1st of April uh, 15, which was the day after the funding ended under the previous programme. Um, now, you, you weren't on the committee, and the other members of the committee will be able to fill you in, I'm sure, about uh, some of the difficulties that, that arose with Connor has referred to, about the challenges of, of setting up a new programme while yes. closing down the old programme. But we were very keen to make sure that continuity of funding was there, and uh, I mean, all the projects ha are up and running and have been for some time. So, uh, you know, there are other European pro programmes, including ESF programmes in other jurisdictions, where uh, the Funding under the 14 to 20 programme hasn't been allocated yet. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Right. Just, uh, just one question. It's actually on the back of, uh, and I know it's about ESF, and I know uh, that, that uh, it may have drifted a, a, a bit in some of the conversations. First of all, you understand where Jared's coming from, and uh, the, obviously the need uh, for qualifications because uh, eventually people with qualifications will get jobs. You know, they, they may. Uh, in the present circumstances, have to try a bit harder. Uh, and I, but uh, when you go back uh, to the level one, you know that I think that the concentration of this committee over a lengthy period of time has been in the round needs, and how you bridge that gap between uh, trying to encourage people who would be neat uh, and, uh, and and encourage them through through the education. Everything that we hear uh, from people who would uh, that uh, that would try to work with people who are neat. Uh, who would try to encourage them and then say that uh, level one isn't sufficient enough uh, to, uh, to, 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 to bring people through. Because if they get them onto the ladder, they're going to look beyond level one and rather than have it just a level one and some people may leave and not go back again. Have you had that continuity uh, through? So I think uh, uh, the, the, there needs to be a, a, a re-look uh, at that. Because I think there, it does be a bit disjointed at him about what people who work at the coalface says believe is essential and what the department uh, would be pushing as part of any new strategy. We do engage uh, on an ongoing basis with the NEED Strategy Forum, and we have a NEED Advisory Group, which has helped us with developing and, and monitoring the implementation of the Pathways to Success Strategy. Uh, and we've made sure that the NEED strand of this programme is very closely aligned with and continues to deliver the Pathways to Success Strategy, because we had uh, short-term funding programmes for the two or three years before uh, the ESF programme started, and we've been able to mainstream a lot of that work um, that the organisations working with young people who are neat have been doing into the new ESF programme. Um, so, I mean, we, we, we have multiple, I suppose, ways of engaging with those organisations that have the expertise. Th those are the young people, really, where we get the feedback about um, 
It's the additional support that they can be offered. It's the confidence. It's the dealing with issues of drugs and alcohol, or uh, you know, problems in their family and so on. Um, you know, where uh, those organisations are concentrating particularly. What we want this programme as a whole to do is to be able to help people get up that ladder, and that does mean progressing from these ESF projects on to projects or, or courses elsewhere and into a job. And often, I mean, there are the people who have the qualifications uh, who, you know, don't have the employability skills. And again, it's about giving them those skills and helping them into a job. Uh, and we're monitoring very closely how, how the organisations manage with that and, uh, and, and, and individuals progress. John, I, I think and I appreciate that then. I think all of us have met uh, the needs form uh, on a number of occasions, both in this thing and uh, in their own way, they, they do uh, they do a good job. Uh, but there is a whole world I'd say that we group uh, that that meets. You know, you go into the community I represent, and the biggest problem they face is drugs, uh, unemployment, serious social problem, lack of education, uh, poor health. And, I, and there's nobody uh, except local community structures uh, that are working directly with them. You know, they are the, the real needs of this world, and unless we actually uh, try to find out how they are, you know, one of the biggest things that's hitting people is heroin, uh, cocaine, um, the, the, the all other forms of medication, uh, uh, prescription medication. And that's a, that's daily life. You know. What we need is a, is a strategy that allows you to, to deal with. Uh, that effectively. Because we sat here four years ago and talked about this. We sat here uh, longer and uh, how that needs strategy would, Im would impact. I can't just rest at uh, a, a level that you have a, a, a wee foam sitting there, good and all that it may be, uh, but it's not um, impacting on where the real problems is. I mean, we, we do have a lot more provisions specifically to tackle those kind of issues in place now than we had four years ago. I mean, we developed the Pathways to Success strategy. We had the Collaboration and Innovation Fund and all the projects that were supported under that, and now we've kind of got that specific strand. I mean, this was the first time we identified specific issues uh, within the, the general uh, economic inactivity and, and unemployment uh, um, Field. We identified the young people who were need as a specific group that we wanted a strand of projects to to cater for, and those types of issues that you're talking about, the drugs and alcohol. Uh, you know, we get a lot of feedback from the projects about having to deal with those kinds of issues, uh, and uh, you know, it is. You know, you could argue that some of these issues should be uh, tackled by the health and social care system, but the reality is we want those projects to be as much of a one-stop shop for those young people as they possibly can be, uh, so they, they tackle the range of issues, uh, but the focus is always on employability. And I mean, I haven't mentioned the Community Family Support Programme, which is a strand of of the ESF programme as well, uh, which again we've mainstreamed, that was one of the short term uh, programmes funded under uh, the um, Economy and Jobs Initiative. So we've got that and that's uh, covering the whole of the region. There are six areas we've, we've broken it down into, and there are five organisations covering those six uh, um, contracts for us. Uh, and so that's a, that's a programme that's open to people in, in every part of, of Northern Ireland. Yeah, sure. Just, just one more thing, and and, and I know that, that uh, uh, several years ago I had you out and uh, meeting people, and uh, and uh, uh, that one of the areas that's directly the impact and the fact of it. And I know that uh, you've said that uh, it's a, it's a health and social care issue. It's all our problems, you know. And unless you have a um, an overarching strategy that includes everybody. But the people that's usually left out of when these strategies are worked out are the people that directly work with people on the ground and work in the cold faces here. And uh, there needs to be the confidence there uh, to allow you to be able to, uh, to go in. Because in many ways, they're the people uh, that know the difficulties uh, that is facing. And I think the more that that's shared, the better uh, outcomes that you'll get in the end of the day. But that uh, whilst uh, health and social care may be one aspect of it, criminal justice is another, education is another. So we need to pull all the strings in the car and try to get a strategy that, that, that deals with it. Okay, thanks. And I mean that, that's what we've sought to do with <coughs> Pathways to Success. We have the, the need to The jury's still out. Which all, all the, the departments are represented on. So. <laughs> and I mean, we're, we're looking at how we refresh that at the moment.
to me either, and I just just a quick one. Yeah. Just a quick one. Yeah. Yes, Chair, just come and thank you for your presentation, sir. Uh, and the chair has brought up the issue of the Ulster uh, University Certificate of Education. And uh, obviously, you're telling us that you have a, a working group set up to look into this. Uh, how confident are you that you'll reach a resolution? Or could we be sitting here some months down the line, maybe with the possibility of some groups? Uh, being denied funding because of this particular issue. But do you think this can be resolved in this uh, common ground that certificates can be uh, Yes. Up, rather than quite sure of that? Uh, uh, yes. I mean, I, I can speak for another five minutes on it, but I think yes answers your question. Um, I did say that, but I've got the answer. If, uh, as long as we're not dealing with this. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think part of what we have needed to do uh, since I started in September was, was almost take a, a fresh approach to engaging with the ESF uh, projects themselves uh, and demonstrate that we wanted to work collaboratively for a variety of historical reasons. You know, there have been difficult relationships between the department and the, the projects themselves. I think once we get over those barriers, there's a greater recognition on the part of the projects of the requirements and the reasons why the department wants to introduce a policy. And there's a greater recognition on the part of the department as to the difficulties which are faced by the projects. And that meeting of minds, I think, was, was demonstrated very clearly in the, the swift, relatively swift, and I think good outcomes with regard to the ES1 form. And that gives me confidence that we can find similar compromises. And with policy, it will always be a compromise to a greater or lesser extent, but we will find a resolution which will be acceptable to, to all parties. And you talk about the number of weeks down the line, you quite calm, this can be resolved quite quickly. <coughs> if, if people left me alone in a room for two or three days, I'm quite certain I could, I could do it. That's, that's, <laughs> I just stop asking AQ. That would be great. That would be great. Um, no, I am, I, as I say, I, I hope to be looking at that solidly over the next couple of weeks. Appreciate your, your answer. Thank you. Uh, just two very quick ones to finish. Back to the 37.49 million had was original letters of offer down to 33.2. Of that drop, 4.2 million. Was, was there any particular sector was more prevalent than not taking up the full letters of offer? Uh, no. I mean, it was effectively spread across each of the strands. And bear in mind that the reason why there were amendments. Uh, was entirely based on projects' ability to find match funding. As you know, the match funding represents 35%. Um, the match, yes. Uh, so where projects were unable to find the full 35%, as was stated, well then, that the reduction in their match funding is reflected proportionally across both the ESF contribution and the Dell contribution. So the inability of projects to find the full level of match funding was reflected across almost all strands of the project. So there was no one particular sector uh, affected more than any other. In, in regards to, there was take up then from FE colleges as well. Did they take up the full amount or did they drop? I can't, I don't have the figures in, in my head at the moment. Um, I, I think with, what, with regard to one particular college, there was a difficulty in finding match funding. In for year one, which they then decided to match fund themselves. Um, but I don't know whether they decided to you match fund it. I, I, I can. But in terms of year two, um, I mean, the, the letters of offer that uh, the organisations received covered the ESF share for uh, the full three years. And you know, there will be projects which may have had to reduce slightly in, in level in, in year one. Uh, because of difficulty in securing match funding, but the offer is still there of the full amount uh, that they were originally offered for year two. So uh, certainly we would encourage the committee and, and others to use your influences with potential match funders to encourage them to uh, to make match funding available if, if some of the organisations are having difficulty because uh, these are very worthwhile projects for uh, a range of uh, other public sector funders uh, to, to help support. Uh, and I mean, as I've said, we do expect to continue match funding uh, from the department for uh, the projects that we, we did in 15-16. Uh, we're, we're just in, in liaison still with the projects about the amounts. Okay. 
Okay. I suppose just one, one final point. Your JRs, according to the paper, Lisburn City Council didn't progress. Ashley Brown has been dismissed, and Niagara still has a chance to appeal. Niagara, the, the uh, judge uh, found that they didn't have, uh, did, did, didn't grant them leave for judicial review. Um, I understand they do have a short period. <laughs> Tendency to appeal, but uh, I mean, the, the, certainly the ruling by the judge was that they, they were not granted uh, leave. Okay. okay, thank you. Connor, Paul, and Fiona, thank you very much. Okay, members, moving on now. Agenda item 9, departmental briefing summary of responses of the consultation on developing modern and efficient and effective employment tribunals. Members, page 45 in your pack. My name is Mr John McEwan and Dr Alan Scott. They're now here nearly as much as some of the members. <laughs> <laughs> John, Alan, you are very welcome. Over to you. Thank you, sir. We did express our concern on the way up that you would be totally fed up looking at this <laughs> night, sir. Um, but uh, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to, to brief the committee today on responses to the Department's consultation on tribunal reform. Um, members of the committee will have received a paper setting out the key issues, but if you're content, I'll summarise the main points. Um, it should be clear from the outset that the Department is still considering policy options, and uh, really this morning is about uh, taken on board feedback from, from the committee uh, on the issues that uh, we will summarise. And then Alan and I will be happy to take that feedback and provide any further information or clarification as needed. And by way of background, tribunal rules and procedures were last substantively revised in 2005. And employment law has, of course, moved on over the past 10 years. And it's important that our tribunals keep pace with those developments. At the same time, I don't want to suggest that there hasn't been change. In fact, important practice changes have been made on a gradual basis, uh, led principally by the President of the Tribunals. These changes have been targeted at avoiding delay and giving parties uh, the opportunity to get uh, quicker outcomes. They have included the introduction of more robust case management, a rigorous postponement policy, listing targets which are uh, reported on annually and a memorandum of understanding with the Labour Relations Agency, setting out essentially how the two organisations can work together for the benefit of all parties. These changes have helped eliminate the significant backlog of cases that once existed. Cases are now dealt with uh, within much shorter timescales than before. However, over this period there has not been a, a fuller consideration of the Tribunal's operation in broader terms. So the Department has sought to remedy that through the Employment Law Review, uh, one of which is key themes had been the efficient and effective tribunals, uh, employment tribunals in Northern Ireland. Uh, the consultation, which ran for 12 weeks from July to September of last year, was the culmination of significant work to develop new tribunal rules and procedures. It was undertaken by the Tribunal Rules Committee, which consists of judiciary and legal representatives, following the Minister's request to it to make recommendations on revised rules, taking account of good practice developments in Great Britain and considering the specific needs of Northern Ireland tribunal users. So I'll quickly run through uh, the views of, that were provided by stakeholders in response to uh, the consultation. The consultation firstly asked whether the proposed new tribunal rules are less complex and easier to understand than the existing rules. And there was general consensus that, uh, that they are, that that was the case. We have received some useful drafting suggestions which will be considered in developing the final rules. And we do accept that there is only so much that can be done to simplify what is, at the end of the day, a legal instrument. The draft rules establish an overriding objective of dealing with cases fairly and justly. Defining what this means in practice is set out in the briefing paper that members will have received. Over two-thirds of consultees considered the proposed overriding objective as appropriate. There were, however, some concerns about including reference in it to the financial position of each party, if that leads to less well-resourced claimants being treated more favourably than better-resourced respondents. That is certainly not the intention, and the overriding objective also makes clear that parties are to be on an equal footing. 
In relation to alternative dispute resolution, the consultation went on to ask whether the rules do enough to recognise the importance of alternative dispute resolution. This relates to the LRA's role in conciliating cases. Around two-thirds of consultees considered that the new rules do make appropriate reference to alternative dispute resolution, and the remainder considered that more could be done and the Department will review this feedback, including feed feedback from the LRA itself, suggesting the need for further references to be included. Regarding any concern on whether the draft rules are appropriately linked with the proposed new LRA Early Conciliation, conciliation Service, the most significant concern was about the effect of extensions of time to allow for early conciliation to take place. Early conciliation will allow for normal time limits to be paused to give the parties time to reach a settlement. The Department, however, does recognise the importance of clearly communicating uh, the impact on tribunals. The LRA is liaison closely with ACAS in Great Britain, seeking to learn lessons from the implementation of early conciliation there. There was also some concern that parties not interested in early conciliation could nevertheless be delayed by the process. And the Department's intention is that where parties are not interested in the process, it will be brought to an end uh, quickly. A number of stakeholders wanted assurance that the LRA will be re appropriately resourced to deliver all of its services, including those new services proposed by the Employment Bill. And the Department uh, at committee uh, and further afield has, also, uh, has already indicated that it expects to receive a business case shortly from the LRA, which will set out a bid for additional resources, and this will be given full and proper consideration. On the issue of presidential guidance, the draft rules include a provision which will allow the President of the Tribunals to issue guidance on how particular issues should be approached. The proposal received significant support. Although some were concerned that it could introduce additional complexity, others thought that it could support clearer expectations on the part of users and greater consistency in tribunal decision making. The President recently began engagement with users to seek views on the topics that presidential guidance should cover, and the Department will feed into that process the responses it has already received. The consultation asked for feedback on rules dealing with the acceptance or rejection of claims and the way in which cases are managed. Case management powers include the facility to specify a lead case where a number of claims relate to the same issue, with the outcome of that claim being persuasive for the remainder. They also include the ability to strike out cases in a variety of exceptional circumstances, such as where they are misconceived or vexatious. Most who commented agreed that the case management powers set out in the rules are sufficiently clear and flexible. <clears throat> a range of drafting suggestions were made, which again the Department will consider. A question was asked about early case management, which in general terms is about communicating with parties early, describing what they will need to do, and helping them generally appreciate where they stand. This can include an element of early neutral evaluation. And again, the, these proposals were generally well received. There were some concerns that early neutral evaluation should not be directive or legally binding and should not be seen as a replacement for professional advice. Ultimately, the service is intended to give parties a well-informed view of where they stand in the case, but the parties remain free to seek their own advice and to pursue the case if that is what they believe is appropriate. The value in the approach is to give parties the information they need to make better informed decisions about how they should proceed with their case. Some consult consultees suggested that there could be confusion about how early case management links with the current case management processes, and we accept that creating confusion is in no one's interest, and the Department will take those points into account. On the subject of deposits, Members will be aware from our discussions around the Employment Bill that the consultation asked whether powers should be set in place which would allow tribunals to require multiple deposits, and if so, whether there should be an overall maximum. <coughs> deposits can be required where a case is considered to have little reasonable prospect of success. The consultation asked a range of questions in connection with this issue. It asked whether a mechanism should be introduced such as already exists in Great Britain, to require more than one deposit in a case where more than one issue that is part of the case is considered to have little reasonable prospect of success. It also asked whether a similar power should be available in respect of each respondent named in a case, 
recognising that a weak case or a weak claim can impact on more than one respondent. We also asked whether if multiple deposits are permitted, there should be a maximum cumulative deposit. And finally, on this issue, the Department asked whether a party who loses the case for the reasons set out in the deposit order should forfeit their deposit, even if no costs are ordered at the end of the proceedings. Currently, the party would have the deposit returned in these circumstances. Two-thirds of responses to the consultation supported the use of multiple deposits. However, it is notable that there was a significant divergence of opinion on the issue between employer and employee representatives. Opposition to the measure focused on the potential for multiple deposits to deter tribunal claims with merit, leading to negative impacts from an equality and access to, adjustment, to justice standpoint. Supporters of change argued that multiple deposits would give tribunals more nuanced powers to single out weak aspects of claims while allowing the remainder to proceed, arguing that this could save time and cost. Opinion was relatively evenly divided on whether the maximum level of any deposit should stay the same at £500 or increase to £1,000. Those who commented on whether there should be a maximum cumulative deposit did not agree on the level at which it should be set, and the figures in, in that respect were ranging from £1,000 to £7,000 or to no limit at all. Most consultees agreed that a party who pays a deposit and goes on to lose the case for the reason identified in the deposit order should forfeit the deposit regardless of the outcome of the case. We've talked uh, previously at the committee about uh, access to tribunals by vulnerable people and the department wants to ensure that obstacles are not placed in the way of vulnerable people who wish to access employment tribunals. But the consultation asked whether the rules adequately address the position of vulnerable people, how presidential guidance might help in that circumstance and whether the department ought to consider further support measures. Responses suggested a range of actions that the Department should consider to strengthen the rules and associated guidance. Suggestions included presidential guidance to address the needs of vulnerable people, clear guidance, tailored advice, and better engagement with organisations representing vulnerable people and more flexible tribunal processes. Ensuring that vulnerable people have appropriate support is an important issue, and it is likely that improvements in this area will be iterative as the tribunals take on board feedback and build up good practice. There are already some positive measures in place and more are proposed within these new rules, for example with regard to the restricted reporting of sensitive information and allowing the use of video links to give evidence. We have also previously discussed at committee the issue of unpaid awards and uh, that is another issue on which the department sought feedback. <laughs> Um, and this was in relation to actions necessary to address the failure of some parties to pay awards ordered by tribunals. <clears throat> in Great Britain, powers have been taken through the Small Business Enterprise and Employment Act of 2015 to allow financial penalties to be imposed on employers who do not pay employment tribunal awards, costs awarded against them, or sums due under conciliated settlements. <coughs> As a first stage in the procedure, a warning notice will be issued advising the employer of the intention to impose a financial penalty, with 28 days allowed to pay or to set out a case as to why no financial penalty should be imposed. Subject to certain caveats where payment is required, it will be 50 per cent of the sum owed or 100 per cent if the employer has defaulted on an agreement to pay by instalments, accepting that the minimum amount of the penalty will be £100 and the maximum £5,000. And the intention here is that this will act as a deterrent at attempts to avoid payment. Importantly, the monies recovered will be payable to the state rather than the individual to whom they are owed. The Department had no settled view on the suitability of that system for Northern Ireland and wished to use the consultation to gather evidence. However, few consultees were able to give clear evidence of non-payment of awards and views on the issue and possible solutions therefore varied. This is a matter on which further policy development will definitely be needed. In relation to reasons for judgments or decisions, the draft rules set out a proposed approach to giving reasons for a tribunal's judgment. Generally, the effect is that reasons can be given orally at a hearing or later in writing. 
If they are given orally at the hearing, then they only need to be provided, to be provided in writing if a request is received to that effect within two weeks of the hearing taking place. The reasons are to be proportionate to the significance of the issue. Two-thirds of stakeholders who expressed a view on this rule felt that it struck the right balance. However, some were concerned that the absence of written reasons in some cases could hinder the development of clear case law, make it harder to understand outcomes, or secure advice on potential appeals. They also considered that it could complicate third-party legal insurance arrangements or create difficulties for employers in trying to implement policy changes in light of a judgment. These concerns, again, will be considered as part of the process of developing the final version of the rules. And in relation to the subject of costs, the consultation asked whether the proposed arrangements around costs are currently appropriate. Tribunals do not order parties to pay costs as a matter of course. An order to pay another party's costs, or for that party's preparation time, will generally only be considered in very limited circumstances relating in the main to unreasonable conduct. So a tribunal may have regard to a party's ability to pay in making an order for costs. While there was majority support for the cost provisions of the rules, some employer representatives felt either that insufficient use was being made of existing cost provisions or that these should be further strengthened. The consultation also asked for evidence of parties being unreasonably warned about having to pay costs. An opinion was divided on this issue. Some employer representatives considered cost warnings to be a necessary and appropriate tool to deter claims lacking merit. Focus minds on the issues or encourage settlement. However, for opponents, these were viewed as threats routinely used by some respondents to, uh, to bully or to deter claimants from pursuing cases with merit. So the policy options proposed there included making no change, uh, introducing an outright ban, provision of clear information on the circumstances in which costs are awarded and how often this tends to be done. There was also consideration that presidential guidance requiring the use of standard wording in letters warning of costs and a mechanism allowing the tribunal to adjudicate on the reasonableness or otherwise of such a threat. Again, Chair, we have uh, discussed a number of times at committee uh, the issue of titles then and the uh, employment judge. Uh, the consultation asked whether the term employment judge should be used instead of chairman. And as I say, members are already aware of the background to this proposal from briefing on the Employment Bill. In response to the consultation question on this issue, just over half of those who expressed a view considered that it was appropriate for the term employment judge to be incorporated within the rules. Those favouring the change considered that it established a consistent approach to the use of terminology and would communicate the reality that tribunals are a forum for providing a legal judgment. Those who opposed the change in terminology argued that it would increase the formality of the tribunals. The present employment bill facilitates the change in terminology being made by way of regulation should a decision be made to do so. And just the last couple of issues were around guidance and on user engagement. The consultation reviewed current provision of information and guidance, asking whether there was a need to supplement what is already available. It asked what the focus of revised guidance ought to be and sought views on the extent to which a more varied approach to delivery, for example, using multimedia and electronic means, might be useful. Consultees were also asked how users could be helped to understand the nature of the process, including the potential value of claims. There was substantial agreement that there is a need to improve available guidance and provide a more innovative way to deliver <coughs> guidance. For example, use of plain language and accessible formats development of online tools, <coughs> greater consistency and better signposting, and key information supplemented by detailed guidance and the availability of directive advice. <coughs> so it was suggested that guidance should focus on what parties can expect, the roles of staff and tribunal members, uh, how to prepare for a tribunal, examples of how cases progress at tribunal, and the potential value of, of claims. Recognising that the existing tribunal user group is comprised mainly of legal <coughs> representatives, the consultation asked how user engagement could be improved. Responses suggested that <coughs> steps needed to take in, to increase the visibility of the user group, possible widening of membership, other forms of engagement with tribunal users, 
and ways of canvassing the views of individuals who may only use the tribunal once. So the department intends to set up a working group to consider these proposals around guidance, and the president has already the tribunal president has already asked for further views on user engagement. Chair, that's a very quick rattle through uh, what was a lengthy consultation uh, document, and I hope I've covered the the key points made in response to the consultation. Uh, I do appreciate that there may be particular areas in which the committee has an interest and. Alan and I will be happy to, to deal with any of those, and but principally listen to the, the feedback from committee. Thank you. Well, thanks, Robin, and good to see you again. Um, I'll re reiterate the point I made a number of occasions. I welcome some of the things that have been ruled out, uh, particularly around uh, the imposition of fees on, on people that are taking cases. Um, I want to focus firstly on the issue facing people that are given a tribunal award or there's a settlement reached, but the uh, defendant as such doesn't make that payment. Um, you, you've referenced the, the section of the Small Business Enterprise and Employment Act 2015 clause 150 that deals with it. Have you given any consideration to introducing uh, similar legislation here? Because the, the clause 7 of the, the 2011 Employment Act, um, I, as you said, only gives the, the power to enforce as if it was a, a, an order of the county court. Yes, so um, that, that uh, provision in the 2011 Act was, was sort of a first step mm -hmm. so that the tribunal didn't have to itself um, make such an order. But I, th I think now this consultation was about trying to establish what more needed to be done. We've now got that feedback and I, I, my sense of it is that we wanted to establish whether people uh, were agreeable to the GB approach and my suspicion was that some people might not welcome the idea that the, the, the money would not be payable to the person who actually uh, has not been paid it by, by the respondent or, or in fact by the claimant in some cases. So we are really wanting to establish opinion around that and we don't really have a clear sense yet of what people would, would like to do on that one. And I think that going forward we need to liaise more with the Department of Justice to see what systems they are operating, where they feel there are flaws, and, where, and actually engage as well further with the likes of the Law Centre, who uh, represent people and, and have been able to say that there are evidence, that there are items of evidence of awards not being paid. So we want to really get at where this happens and, and how that, that might be addressed. So what are the next steps then? I think the next steps are, um, well, it will really pr probably be taken forward under the new department, but it will be to, to uh, engage with the likes of the Law Centre uh, and also employers because, I mean, they will, they will claim in some cases that, you know, costs have been awarded against the claimant and they're not, they haven't received any, any payment. So it will be uh, really uh, engagement with, with people who have significant experience of using the tribunal system and, and where they have been able to identify problems, looking at what those are, and then uh, probably talking to the Department of Justice about how we can best take a joint approach to resolving those, because there are many issues here which really rest within the court system, and it's about being able to pursue those in a realistic way through the courts. I see in your, in your document you've said that Peninsula argued that um, existing measures are suf sufficient because it would not be in the public interest to pursue payment uh, of awards resulting in a company having to close. Do you think that's a, a good enough argument for leaving the, the current arrangements in place? Well, I think um, it, the, the argument would probably be that uh, their argument would probably be that uh, you know that they don't want they don't want the company going under. But at the same time, if a company isn't pursuing, it isn't complying with legal requirements, there is a duty I would suspect to to pursue that issue. Um, and so, while the ministerial decision you know, will need to be made to say on what, what answer there is here, it probably isn't enough to say uh, that it's okay to sort of not uh, comply with the legal requirements because there might be other impacts. I think if the legal requirements are there, they, they would need to be complied with. Answer wrong. Um, in terms of the uh, law centre's request for the option of adjudication for straightforward low-value claims. Um, the response you gave us during the committee stage of the consideration of the bill um, was that the department was open to considering that potential as part of the proposed review of the LRA's arbitration scheme. Yes. Um, what's the time frame for that? 
The review of the arbitration scheme needs to be really taken forward over the next year. Um, so I think I'd said before the terms of reference were being prepared. Now, unfortunately, those aren't yet finalised. But there is a draft, and we need to now focus. Now that we're we're making progress finally with the employment bill, we're getting it through, and it can now turn to that work, turn to developing early conciliation as well, and. Uh, also to pre preparations for the system of neutral assessment. So all of that, that work will uh, be related and also work in terms of the tribunals to see uh, you know, where this type of work would fit. Would it fit within the likes of uh, a neutral assessment system? Mm -hmm. Is there a role perhaps for the LRA arbitration scheme to look at cases like this? Uh, so that is ongoing work and uh, I think it will be happening over the next year. Okay. I had also meant to ask you, um, as well as um, awards not being paid, is there also uh, any evidence or claims that um, where a tribunal insists or the claimant accepts the reinstatement of a position uh, in addition to or, or instead of a, a payment of an award? Is there any evidence or claims being made that that's not happening? I'm not aware of any of them, but I'm very, very happy to, to receive that if it's brought forward to us. Yeah. Okay, no, I haven't heard of them. I'm just wondering whether there's something you've heard. Um, <coughs> can you advise us as to whether the, the, the outcome of this is going to be that um, employment uh, and industrial tribunals um, become less legalistic um, and more accessible to, to people on both sides of the argument? Is that what the, the overall outcome uh, will hopefully be? I think that. There's, a, there's two competing demands here. There, there is the increasing, uh, there are increasing legal requirements which are coming down from, you know, various European directives. There are uh, increasing complexity of case law. So I think those are, are aspects of the tribunal system that it will be difficult to change. But I think what we need to do is to make it such that people can better understand what the process is, how they approach it, and get a better sense of where they stand within it. So, in terms of being able to reduce the legality of the proceedings, the, the, the way in which legal decisions are made, I don't think that's really uh, on the table at the moment. But I think it is about trying to make people better understand where they stand within it. Okay. And have, have you or your colleagues spent much time observing employment and industrial tribunals to see uh, how they're run at the minute? Uh, well, we, we have. Um, I've been, been involved in a number of tribunal cases um, for, for various on various issues, and yes, I think we, we do get the sense that it can be very intimidating or daunting for some people, and that's why we want to bring together uh, the stakeholders to, to, to get a sense of where they think the, the most difficult aspects are, and also to broaden the existing user group of the tribunals, because it is primarily legal representatives at the minute, to get a sense of what it is that people want in order to better understand the system. For somebody who's never experienced it before, what are the initial questions that they have that maybe wouldn't occur to somebody who uh, accesses it on a regular basis? It might be an idea for you to, to facilitate um, either members of this committee uh, going to a tribunal or if you wanted to defer it until the new mandate to members of the new committee so that uh, MLA is involved in scrutinising these type of things, have some sort of an understanding as to how these tribunals work. And, what and certainly uh, the, the uh, tribunal hearings are generally public accessible, so yeah. committee members would be very welcome to, to attend on, on most of them. Okay, thanks, Phil. Uh, thank you, Chair. And <clears throat> thanks, John and Alan. Um, just really a comment regarding the language and the drafting and, uh, and why there has been improvements to that. You'll see, obviously, from the, the document, <coughs> the consultation document, that there's still concerns being raised um, from the Citizens Advice on Ulster University. So I hope that the just will take on very serious consideration of the concerns that they're raising. And also, given the fact that <coughs> there have been issues raised in this committee about the uh, number of unrepresented litigants who actually currently go through the system. And <clears throat> we had raised with yourselves that in our informal meeting uh, with the, I think it was the Bar Council, that um, one of the people that we met said that probably seven out of the ten cases that they deal with, you know, are usually people who are unrepresented. So I think that is quite important because we don't really know where we are, where we are currently at regarding um, <clears throat> the gap that we have in terms of that 
um, personal legal advice because that gap's still there. So I think it's important um, that you do take on uh, um, or the, the concerns that's, that have been raised by, by those organisations. Yes, and certainly uh, there are two points raised there really, and the first one is about the, the language and drafting, and certainly we, we do want to take on board whatever concerns have been raised, but as I think we've said, the issue is that with a legal document there's only so much that can be done to make it accessible, so I think what we need to do is make very clear guidance that's associated with it and explain exactly what the rules are intended to do, and, and, and explains people's entitlements and explains what the different uh, phases of the tribunal process are. And that's what we will be doing with the, the, the guidance working group that we're going to be setting up. In terms of um, the issue of uh, advice, uh, I think that is something that, that, that we've definitely taken on board from what it is said. And I think we've already uh, indicated that we do provide funding already to the Law Centre, which uh, is able to fund a limited number of cases. appreciate that it's not uh, the end solution. But uh, I think that it is a start, and we do need to maybe look at, uh, in a broader in broader terms, about uh, how funding is distributed. And I think um, we also do need to take into account the fact that there are other mechanisms, such as alternative dispute resolution through the Labour Relations Agency, which is very useful for people, and also the um, the uh, new processes of neutral assessment that are uh, and early conciliation that are being proposed. So I think there's a suite of measures there, but certainly. It, it, we do need to take a look at the, the funding uh, and how that is distributed, and are we are we making the best use of available resources? Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Ronald Jared. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to Alan and John for the the update on the consultation. Bit of an awful lot to add to what's been said. I think it is reflecting a movement towards better position in terms of more user friendly, more um, accessible to the general public, and I take on board the tensions between actually delivering something where you have to deal with employment law and the restrictions of that and also having a system that people can use. Um, there, I think just from my own limited experience of tribunals there's quite a variation uh, <coughs> depending on obviously who's who's on the panel and what attitude they take to somebody taking the tribunal in terms of the, the direction they can go when people talk about them uh, in terms of tribunals being able to jump up and bite people depending on who's on the panel and who they sympathise with. But I suppose we're very often facing the situation where the person taking the tribunal is facing an employer that maybe has a lot more resources when it comes to being able to fund whatever their uh, position is. So we have to be aware of that dynamic, whilst at the same time weeding out the, the, any vexatious stuff, because there is we know that's in the system and there are people that <coughs> sometimes regrettably are, uh, are intent on doing something like that without real justification. I just wondered, in terms of the, the variety of responses that you received, and I'm taking on board that you've had stuff from the Law Centre, CAB, Ulster Law Clinic, and some private law firms as well, what's your view generally on the on the quality, the, the level of engagement that you've had in the consultation, and the range of responses and effectiveness of that? And do you, do you see it as an incomplete picture that you need? Uh, you were talking about other things that needed to be looked into. Um, just wondered what your what your view was generally of the, the process and what you've got. I think the, the broader picture is probably one that we are maybe lacking in a little bit is, is, is from the individual tribunal user who maybe encounters a tribunal <coughs> once or twice in their life, and that could be a small employer, it could be an individual claimant. Mm. Uh, and I think what we need to be considering is, is there a means of gathering information about pe those people's experiences of the tribunal system, and, and separating that out from if, the, if they've won or lost the case, that might very strongly colour how they feel about it. So it's, it's really saying, trying to get at the information, was this a good process? You may feel that you, you didn't get the outcome that you wanted, but did you get a, a fair hearing? Did you get the, enough information to help you decide how to proceed? So it's trying to get at that information <coughs> in a way that isn't coloured by a person's individual outcome. Uh, and I think we, we'll need to pursue looking at whether it's uh, follow-up questionnaires or research into that. And it's, it's certainly one of the options for the new department to look at, I think. And I think that's that's one of the things we're looking at in terms of wider consultation on employment relations. We've we've discussed this at committee in, in the past few weeks, too, about how we reach people in consultation. Um, and there's been reference to the kind of usual suspects come yes. forward, which is always appreciated, but does it reach... Um, you know the the vulnerable people that we were talking about in this context. So, 
in terms of not only this consultation but the, the wider employment relations consultations that we're engaging with. We've taken those comments on board and we want to look at mechanisms, yeah. um, you know, focus groups or whatever way we can to, to try and get beyond uh, the, the kind of standard responses. Yeah, I think, Chair, that would be wise because I think in this, it is an important piece of work and you can see in the, in the employment bill how work has been done to try and help this in the longer term. But I think it is very important because very often it is the case that you get the people that you would expect, obviously, who have very valid and informed opinions on these things that are coming forward. But in terms of who this is going to affect, it's going to affect a whole wide range of people. Um, and I think there is a need and a, a, an imperative on the department as opposed to go to a further level to ensure that you get that widest range of opinion across a whole uh, strata of different people. So I think that would be, would be interesting to hear. You're talking about focus groups, if there are other Mm -hmm. methods that you're kind of thinking on in terms of engagement because I think you can't, this is something over which you can't over consult I think because it's, it's so important to get it as right as, as we can. And I think that with the previous consultation that has just completed there, there, were, uh, there was a very successful and positive focus group that the Law Centre organised for us and they brought in uh, representatives uh, who work in local advice agencies and a number of uh, uh, legal representatives, and I thought that was that's the type of thing yeah. that if we were able to broaden that out, it'd be a very useful mode of uh, engaging with people. Thank you. Just one thing, Chair. Um, again, thank you for for coming to committee again today, and I think the consultation has thrown up a lot of um, a lot of good things that needs to be looked at and taken on board. There's still concern around the um, around the whole issue of. Um, of, of the language drafting and that type of thing. There's still some concern around that. And I see where Citizens Advice and Ulster University Law Clinic have all said that while um, while the, 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 uh, at the minute the drafting is easier understood than it was, there's still more work to be done there. So I think that's something that the department do need to take on board and look at that to make that uh, again, more simpler for the people to understand it. Yes, and I think we, we do accept that where, wherever that can be done, we will be seeking to do it. And I think that that needs to be then supported by very good explanatory material. Um, I think that the, the challenge is that uh, whenever we're drafting legal documents, there's just there, you know certain phrases or certain wording has particular established legal meanings, and we're just trying to square that circle of making sure that it's, it's a legally watertight document but at the same time making it as simple for people to understand uh, as is reasonably possible within that constraint. <coughs> okay, members, thank you. So, uh, thank you very much, Neil. Okay. Uh, members, after any other business, we'll take an anti closed session just to finalise our, our committee inquiry. <coughs> members, under any other business, there's just been an announcement made, made by Bombardier they're to lose a thousand jobs over the the next two years, so if it would be the mind of the committee, we'll maybe ask for a joint meeting with the Deputy Committee and both Ministers. <coughs> See if we've, we've done something similar before in regard to the Mitchell announcement. Members content with? Yep. Three, yeah. do you progress in that? Okay. Members, any other business? Sydney? Uh, Chair, um, I have a local issue down in, in Portadown. It concerns the, the, the cafe 180 degrees. Uh, as a cafe, it's, it's run by the Charity Step by Step. And uh, it's only a great threat that by the end of March, if it doesn't get funding or some type of funding in place, those doors will close. And bearing in mind the report we're about to go into and consider to finalise, these are young people who have uh, learning disabilities and uh, learning difficulties. And uh, I do know that there's a public meeting next Tuesday in the evening. I think there's certain. Uh, people who are pulling this together. I'm told that there may be a possible meeting with, with the, the Minister uh, by uh, some of the, those people and maybe political parties. But I think we as a committee need to maybe write to the <coughs> Department, to the Minister, if it's possible, to, uh, to express our concerns in relation to the, these type of young people who are uh, 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 in a position where they could lose out here. Now, I'm told in the background to them that they do great work down there. I have visited and I'll be visiting again this week. And they, uh, those young people, uh, as many as 80 per cent, could go into full time employment uh, in the hospitality uh, sector. Uh, and I think we as a committee need to maybe 
give our weight behind that to see if there's a possibility at this late stage of some type of funding. Uh, and if we could maybe not add our support from the committee to write to the department and to the minister to, to find out if there's a way that maybe that there could be some funding put in there to ensure those uh, the doors are kept open there. It's uh, not as big as Bombardier, but I can assure you to those young people, it is greatly uh, recognised and a great need for it. And I'd ask for that support. Yep. Members content? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, okay. Yep. Roma? Gerard, it was actually the same issue because I was listening, listening to it on the radio this morning at 8 o'clock. And um, so I'm obviously I'm glad that you, you have raised that, but I would fully support Sydney and everything that he's raised. Um, I think we as a committee have to put our money where our mouth is. <coughs> yeah. This has been such a, a big issue for ourselves. And, um, so that's oh. yeah. <coughs> okay, members content? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Members of no other business? Members, date, time and place in next <coughs> meeting, 10 a.m. Wednesday, 23 February 2016 and 29. Right again, in closed sessions. So it's the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29.